Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a programmer and an artist, and today I was trying to solve the problem of if you have a, a series of edges with where each vertex has an angle in it, and you wanted to find a circle that would fit inside of that angle, the largest circle uh, possible, uh, how you would calculate that, because then if, if you could do that, you could smooth out, you could like cut off the each point of the angle and smooth out the curve so that you could using the portions of the circle between where it touched the edges of the edge, then you could keep that and delete the sharp point and you could smooth out your shape that way. Which is essentially what the fillet curve node does um, for curves, but I wanted to be able to, to control it and scale between no fillet and 100%, the smoothest fillet bevel on the curve you could possible. So I was trying to solve that problem and I think I've, I've solved it and I wanted to share uh, how I did it, because it's kind of an interesting problem, I think. So the first thing I'd like to do is just walk through the steps of how I went about solving the problem, and then after that I'll go through the individual nodes. Now to start with, there's two pieces of information that are sort of attributes of the curve that we have to calculate to get, but they're pretty easy to calculate. And those are for each point in the curve, what is the angle of the two of the direction of the next two points, or the previous and next points. And then the second one is um, what are the edges that attach to that vertex, and how long are those? And using that information, we're able to imagine some triangles and things to figure out where the center of a circle would be that would touch the two edges inside of that angle. So to walk through the steps of how that is done, if you find the angle, then you can find the shorter of the two edges that's attached to the point. And if you take half of that, you find the midpoint you want to do the midpoint because if you go past half of this edge, it might happen that the other point that shares that edge also goes past and, and you create an overlap where those two go past. So there might be a more accurate way, or you might be, there's cases, there are cases like this point here is a good example where we could go this much further and it would still work because we could go that much further on this side as well and nothing would overlap. But um, I haven't thought about how you could calculate that. So just to be safe, because it's easy, we'll take half of the length of the shorter of the two edges that connect to a vertex. Then using that distance and the angle, we can calculate an isosceles triangle inside of each of the corners like this. And then we only really care about the base of that triangle, because if we have that base and we know the angle between it and uh, the original edge that we came from, this angle here, then we can calculate the angle that we would need to get a, an edge that's perpendicular to our original, because so, that would be 90 degrees minus that angle. So that would be this direction here, and that direction is going to point towards the center of our circle. Then because we know this angle here and we know the length of this base, we can construct another isosceles triangle that lies like this, and the tip of that isosceles triangle is going to be the center of our circle. So that would be here. We can calculate that. And then if we drew a circle around that point with the same radius as the length of this edge, then we get this result right here, which is exactly what we're looking for. The circle touches the two edges of our curve exactly at the points we wanted. And then the radius of that circle is also the radius we can use in the fillet curve modifier to get this smoothing shape. So then all we have to do is apply that to the curve, which gets us this result right here, which you can see matches exactly the circles that were drawn, like so. Um, so that's the thought process of the solution that I came up with for the problem. Um, I, there may be other ways to solve it, but that's the one I came up with. If I'm gonna go over to this version of the modifier here, which is exactly the same, but without all of the extra nodes for drawing that presentation, and I'll sort of walk through uh, how it works here. The first thing we're doing right here is looking at the previous and the next points and we're calculating the angle of the point. So if we're looking at this point right here, we can get the position of that point with the position node, which we're using here. And then we wanna find the position of the previous and the next points in the curve. And we can do that by using the offset point and curve node with a negative one and a positive one offset and then evaluating the position at those indexes. So that's what these are for. So then we have three positions. We have the position of the previous point, the position of the current point, and the position of the next point. If we subtract the position, uh, our position from the position of the previous point, 
and the position of the next point from our current position, we get two vectors. The first one would go like this, and the second one would go like this. Those are direction vectors from point to point. Then we want to take the normalized dot product of those two vectors. So we need to normalize them so their length is 1. And then we can do a dot product, which will essentially tell us how similar those two vectors are. And if you take the arc cosine of the dot product between two vectors, it'll tell you the angle between the two vectors in radians. So once we get to this point here, we have the angle. Um, I think we actually have the angle from this direction to this direction. So there might actually be a slightly simpler way to do this with like one less node, but uh, this is what I came up with, like I said. So to get the corresponding angle, you can take pi, which is the same as 180 degrees, and subtract this angle from it, and I think that would then get us this angle on the inside here. So that's it for the angle. Um, let's go ahead and go, before we look at the rest of this here, let's go back and look at these nodes here, because they're for calculating the shorter of the two edges, the length of it. So we have our direction vector that we calculated previously from the previous point to our point and from our point to the next point. We're going to reuse those and just measure the length of them to find out how long the edge is. And then once we know how long both of those edges are, if we take the minimum of those two values, it'll tell us the length of the shorter edge. And then if we multiply that by 0.5, we will get half of the distance to the next point. Then we can take our two normalized vectors and scale them by that half of the shorter length value. And that will get us two new direction vectors, one that points from this point on the previous edge to our point, and then another one that points from our current point to this point on the next edge. And so we can take the position that we're at and we can add that first vector to it to get this point here, and we can subtract the second vector from it to get this point here. So by subtracting, we look in this direction instead of this direction. Once we have those two points, we can subtract them from each other. So if we take this point minus this point, it'll give us a direction vector like so. And if we take the length of that vector, it'll tell us how long this edge is right here. So maybe it's four long or whatever. And that length is the length of the base of an, the isosceles triangles that make up this, this pair of isosceles triangles. So that's to calculate the length of the base. Um, once we have the length of the base, going back to our corresponding angle here, so that's this angle right here, we want to take half of that angle, so that would be this angle right here, because um, if we were trying to make a, another isosceles triangle that is perpendicular to this, so this is a 90 degree corner, then this angle is, this triangle right here is going to be similar to this triangle right here. So half of, half of this angle is the same as this angle. And then if we take the cosine of that angle multiplied by 2, so that we can get both sides of this, and then divide that by, divide our length by that value, you will get the actual length of one of these sides here, which is the same as the radius of our circle that we want to use, the same, which is the same value as the radius value we want to use for our circle. So once we have that value here, this divide is the length of one of these sides of this triangle here, then we can just multiply that by our, our, our radius factor to control the amount of smoothing that's applied to the curve. So then you can blend between zero smoothing or the amount of smoothing that's created by these circles here. Now, if you just want to use complete smoothing, it's actually easier to do that. You can see if we come back here and we look at our smooth curve, if we have um, just the regular fillet curve modifier, if all you want to do is get like the max smoothness possible, you can just turn the radius way up. Because the problem with fillet curve is, is you turn the radius up. Um, the radius on all of these is the same. It's a constant value. So at some point, they cross over and you get this weird artifact. But if you turn the radius way up and turn the limit radius on, because unlike the bevel modifier, where if you turn on the 
whatever the limit option on that is, it will limit everything to the smallest, the size of the smallest edge. In this case, it actually will stop corners that need to be smaller early, but then allow other ones to go beyond that. However, you have a lot less control over this because um, on if you have a sharp corner like this that can't bevel more than this amount here, um, as soon as you hit that point on the radius value, which happens really fast, um, you have that much control over it and then it's stuck there. But you've barely started to smooth out these bigger angles. Um, so if you want to completely smooth it out, you can just turn the radius way up. But if you want to have fine control over the amount of smoothing so that the same percentage of the bevel is applied everywhere, then you have to calculate the angle like I showed here. And then you can blend where at zero there's nothing here and at one it's kind of the same. But at 0.5 it's very different because half of the bevel is applied here, whereas without that, with just limit radius, it's already at 100%. If that makes sense. Anyway, so not necessarily the most useful thing in every situation, but sometimes if you want to give control over especially a profile curve for something, if you're going to solidify a curve or a curve to mesh and you want to add some control over the resolution of the corners of the profile curve, um, this could be useful for that. So anyway, hopefully that was interesting. That's how I solved that problem, and I thought it was sort of an interesting solution. So. Thought I would go ahead and share it. Um, if you would like to download the, this project file and, ex and experiment with it or look at it more closely yourself, you're welcome to do that. I'll have it up on my website. And then, um, yeah, there's information about everything that I've made up on my website. So if you haven't seen any of that, uh, feel free to check it out. There's a bunch of cool stuff on there. Um, but yeah, that's all I've got for this one. Thanks for watching.